Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning, and welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday. I'm Bill Vavrick, your moderator for today's webinar, entitled Enhancing the Design Through Value Engineering. Next slide, please. A few housekeeping items to get things started. If you have any issues with the sound and you're using your computer speakers, please try dialing in using a phone. If you have another issue, please use the chat button to send a message to the host. Next slide, please. We encourage you to ask questions, and we'll answer those questions at the end of today's webinar. In order to ask questions, please click on the Q&A button in the top of the WebEx bar and send your questions to the host and panelists. And we'll address these Q&A questions in a Q&A session that is directly after the presentation today. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen mode, at the top of your webinar settings, you can click on the down arrow, highlight view, and then choose fit to viewer. And that'll put you into a full screen mode so that you can see the slides. Just a reminder, to receive the one-hour PDH certificate for today's presentation, you must attend the full one-hour webinar, and more information on how to get your PDH certificate will be provided at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do now is to introduce our presenters. We have two of them today. The first one is Mike Erickson. Mike is a senior structural engineer and protective design engineer with ARA, and he's got over 20 years experience in structural analysis, advanced design methods, explosive weapons effects, vehicle barriers, and access control points. He's participated in numerous value engineering studies as a blast and physical security subject matter expert. Mike's a, a licensed professional engineer in five states, and he's an active member of the American Society of Civil Engineers Blast, Shock, and Impact Committee. He's got both a Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in Civil Engineering with an emphasis on Structural Engineering from Brigham Young University. Mike is a frequent speaker and has spoken on the subject of Security Engineering, Protective Design at numerous international conferences. And I'm proud to say that Mike Erickson is ARA's 2021 Engineer of the Year. Next slide, please. Our second presenter is Ken Hurley. Ken is an ARA Senior Engineer and U.S. Air Force Gulf War veteran. He's held key roles in protective design and security and vulnerability assessments in more than 35 U.S. states and countries. This includes protective design and security engineering to support over 20 U.S. government agencies, as well as participation on numerous value engineering teams supporting the U.S. Department of State, Department of Defense, uh, including design and renovation of facilities within the U.S. and overseas. Ken has done a, a large amount of work with over 70 large-scale explosive tests of building facades. Uh, he's chaired uh, a national vice chair of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Working Group on Explosive Modeling, and he has done work for all sorts of organizations across the U.S. government, including the General Services Administration, GSA, the Department of State, the FAA, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Institute of Steel Construction, American Institute of Architects, and many other organizations. He's a licensed professional engineer in 10 states, uh, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, and is also a certified protection professional and project management professional. Ken's got a Master of Science degree from Auburn, a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of New Orleans, and Associate of Applied Science from the Community College of the Air Force. And now I'll turn the presentation over to my colleague and very good friend, Mike Erickson, who will begin the presentation. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to start with talking about our purpose for the presentation today, noting that formal value engineering studies can extract a great deal of value from projects as we're working on the process of developing design. 
when it's performed correctly, it, the real focus is on function, alternatives, team dynamics, can maximize the design to meet those key functions and performance objectives without sacrificing quality uh, at a minimal cost. And incorporating that value engineering mindset, we found is an important thing throughout the design process to extract greater value from design uh, outside of the value engineering formal study as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the background. Uh, the information presented in this session is based on our participation in numerous VE studies as subject matter experts. We're primarily going to focus on structural security disciplines, which is our specialty, but good value alternatives, of course, come from all types of disciplines and projects. And our experience was drawn primarily from work we've done in partnership with strategic value solutions. Applicability of value engineering. Value engineering is used by a lot of organizations, especially within the federal government. Federal Highway Administration is a heavy user of value uh, engineering studies. Also, the Department of State, Department of Defense, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, FAA, and GSA. They've all found it's very effective in extracting improved value for taxpayers and uh, project owners for major capital projects. In fact, the Federal Highway Administration has Federal Law 23 CFR that prescribes programs and policies for implementing value engineering into planning development. And also, uh, FAR Part 48 describes policies and procedures for using and administering value engineering techniques in contracts. So heavily used, it provides a lot of benefit when used properly. Our objective today is to explore the components of the value engineering process so we can understand how to use it in developing value-based design solutions. Also consider different perspectives and thought processes. A lot of times we've got diverse teams that are contributing different perspectives and experience to help in delivering value and how that can be considered in the value engineering mindset. And then we're also going to review the depth and breadth of the various functions that factor into a formal value engineering study. So moving on to the background, what value engineering is. So we might ask ourselves, what is value? Basically value equals the function of the project divided by the resources to deliver that function. And function is what the product or services is expected to do. The resources is what it takes to provide that function. And that could be time, it could be personnel, it could be money. Uh, and value can address a product like a building or an asset. Uh, it can also be a, a service such as design for building. It's typically multidisciplinary in nature and is applicable to all functional areas of an object or process. And the real key takeaway is that value engineering is not simply cost cutting. So when we're trying to develop a value engineering, we're going to increase value. And we can do that first uh, by increasing the functionality. We can keep the cost, the resources the same. But if we can increase the function of the project, uh, then we've increased the value. Of course, the other way we think of increasing values, we can decrease the resources. The functionality stays the same, but we find another way to deliver that same function with reduced resources. And then the third and best way we could do that is if we can both increase the function and reduce the resources taken to deliver that increased function. So now we have to think about, well, what is best value then? So if we have a theoretical curve that illustrates the functional requirements versus the cost or resource to deliver that function. You have a curve and as you tend to move up in the towards here you get increased costs and you tend to get this kind of diminishing returns. You get reach the 100% of the functional requirements. It usually takes a lot additional cost to deliver a little bit more uh, function uh, towards as we approach perfection. Of course we know perfection is not achievable and you tend to get this diminishing returns which can yield poor value. Of course, the other poor value we reach is down where we're not meeting all the functional requirements. And sometimes in a VE study, we'll find that there are some functional requirements that are not being fully satisfied. And so the target is to find this best value point where we're meeting 100% of the functional requirements at the least amount of cost or resources that delivers that 100% functional requirement status. And that requires thinking outside the box. Of course, we'll have the box that we think tend to work in. And that box is defined by standards, design criteria, constraints that the team puts on itself, assumptions that have been made. That typically defines the initial solution set. 
And our goal with value engineering is to expand that solution set. And so we're going to challenge those constraints, those assumptions, and sometimes even interpretation of standards and design criteria. And in doing that, we're going to generate a series of creative ideas. And some of those creative ideas will fall inside the box. Uh, our objective is to try to find others that fall outside the box as well. And those will be tested and evaluated as the process progresses. And the developed ideas will have some that will fall inside the standard constraints and assumptions of the team and others will be outside. As an example, I had one value engineering study where we were looking at an access control point. The roadway to a site was being reconfigured to improve queuing and uh, space that they had at the site. And there was a, the, the gateway that came, all the vehicles came through for inspection. They needed to move that functionality elsewhere on the site. And the, the default assumptions was that to do that, you were going to demolish the existing one and build a new one. And as we studied it, we found that you could actually, what they wanted looked exactly like, almost exactly like the one that they already had. And so we asked the question, well, do we have to demolish and build a new one or can we move the existing one to the new location? So that's an example. We were pushing the assumptions that were made of how you had to solve the problem. And there could be a variety of ways to do that. So now Ken Hurley is going to talk about who leads a value engineering study and, and the general team dynamics. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, okay, who, who leads a value engineering study? Uh, first of all, we have the value engineering team leader. They're, they're the, essentially the facilitator of, for the VE study. They, they guide and direct the, the VE team. They're, they're essentially they're the ringleader, and the VE team leader is a, a subject matter expert in value engineering. They're highly experienced in leading uh, VE teams and workshops, and they're typically a certified uh, value specialist or a CBS, uh, which means they have the requisite training, experience, and testing to successfully lead value engineering studies. And they also ensure that the value methodology process is properly applied uh, throughout the, the entire course of the value engineering study. We also have the assistant team leader. Uh, assistant team leader supports the team leader throughout the duration of the value engineering study. They coordinate project documents and submittal input with all team members. Uh, they, they work largely behind the scenes throughout the process uh, with assembly of briefings and various types of content uh, supporting the study. And they also serve as liaison with the sponsor uh, with requests for additional information uh, during the course of the study. Next slide, please. Okay, who participates in the process? We have multi, a multidisciplinary team uh, assembled based on the type and scale and needs of a project. Um, some common discipline examples include cost estimators, architects, engineers, and, and we'll go through this list in a minute in more detail. But uh, the essence here is that the, uh, the, the teams can vary in size uh, it, it, from just a handful of subject matter experts on the low end of the spectrum based on the, the needs of the study to uh, several full and comprehensive EE teams working in unison on extremely large projects. And the project types can be varied uh, any, and locations anywhere worldwide or nationwide. So, so team members should, should be adept in addressing the various factors specific to each project especially when looking at uh, projects in, in, in remote locations or, or, or areas outside of their, their, their general region of, of practice. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the first uh, discipline we'll discuss here is the, the cost estimator. Uh, the cost estimator develops cost models for the existing design as well as cost estimates for each value engineering alternative. They, they're, they're largely the focal point on the VE team for all cost assessment and development activities. And, um, and, and the, they, they, they look at the cost from a variety of different perspectives uh, throughout the, the project. And they, they also develop the value engineering team costs, including first cost and life cycle costs. The, the cost estimator is also pretty well versed in the type of project being assessed. Uh, and know what questions to ask for the different subject matter experts when, uh, when developing costs for the different value alternatives. They're also well versed in uh, things such as current market rates and factors that, that will, uh, and, and escalations and things like that, that will uh, factor in, in, into the, the cost development. 
Uh, and that, another thing that the cost estimator does uh, during, as part of the project typically is they'll provide a review and commentary on cost estimates developed by the design team and give some some just some general recommendations on on, on things that they think they can do to, to help refine their, their cost development a little bit more. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, architects. The, the architects uh, for for uh, largely for facility designs, which there is that we focus on more heavily here. They they evaluate the interior and exterior space layout and, and finish designs based on cost and function. This includes uh, the interior of the facility, exterior facility, and the building envelope. Uh, they they also assess uh, the facility functions and operations for potential value improvements. Uh, the, the value improvements consider architectural expression of, of the, the original design intent. And so the, the goal here is, is often to, to try and keep the original architectural design intent and make modifications uh, around that. And, and, you, and there are different types of architects on the team looking at design architects um, and landscape architects and also interior designers sometimes just uh, depending on the project. Next slide, please. Engineers, at engineers, we can have a variety of types of engineers on the team. Uh, and, they, and the engineers coordinate uh, among each other and with the rest of the team uh, and provide input to, to other disciplines uh, throughout the process. They also, could, as, in addition to, as part of the, the VE evaluation, they'll also look at you know, code compliance and future issues that any sorts of, uh, any elements of the current design may potentially face. And, and also to uh, the value alternatives, kind of looking forward um, as, as part of the, the value process. Um, looking at the different types of engineers, the civil engineers, um, and we also sometimes will have geotech uh, engineers on, on the team as well. They'll look at things such as roadway, uh, roadways, the, the overall site, subsurface conditions, water, sewer, utility runs, and such. Structural will cover as a superstructure, substructure, and building envelopes. Mechanical, we'll look at major mechanical systems, uh, and for uh, vertical facilities, H HVAC being a large focus, HVAC is a, it's a, it's a pretty expensive uh, item, um, along, along with uh, building envelopes uh, for structural, and uh, is structural and architectural. And then an, an electrical looks at primary and backup power systems, and we also have IT, telecommunications, um, uh, SMEs on the team as well. Okay, next slide. And then we go on to security. Um, the security experts on the team evaluate security design based on cost and function. Um, looking at both site and facility layout and operations, uh, they'll uh, review proposed countermeasures, uh, physical security and electronic security countermeasures across the site throughout the facility. Okay, next slide. The constructability experts. Uh, that the constructability expert will evaluate uh, the proposed construction approach based on cost and function. Uh, they'll address areas such as space and staging requirements, current local markets uh, for material and labor, potential material and labor issues, permits and permitting, uh, unions, things such as uh, potential issues related to transport uh, of shipping and storage of materials, project schedules and phasing, and also various contract types. Okay, next slide. Then the project risk specialist, sometimes we'll have a, a risk specialist on the team. Evaluating potential risks to the project with respect to cost, schedule, and function. Looking at uh, risk from a variety of different perspectives: uh, financial and the funding risk, political risk, technical risk, contract risk, geographic and local risk, and, and a variety of other areas. Next slide. And then uh, other disciplines uh, on the team, such as blast engineer, uh, facilities management, construction project manager, project controls manager, warranty manager, commission agent, attorney. Uh, it's like largely dependent upon the project as to, to the, the, the selection of subject matter experts for each individual team. Okay, next slide, please. And coming down to this, this is a key element in the uh, in the, 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 the VE process. It's team dynamics. It, it, it's key to the success of, of the project. Um, you have interaction and deep discussion between the various team members, and that provides the best results. There is a lot of back and forth uh, amongst team members throughout the, the process, and this and, and it really creates a, a very dynamic environment um, with, with a lot of good ideas being um, discussed. Next, next bullet. 
provides a full uh, 360 degree assessment that involves subject matter input from all major disciplines. The next bullet. It provides unique insights, but unique insights are provided from a diverse set of professional perspectives. Uh, you see the, the, the you know the variety of different subject matter experts on the team, and they're, and they're, and, and these experts are looking at it from a different you know from a somewhat different perspective than the, than the original design team. What we'll look at the project from, and then key issues and solutions are often identified that we would we, be missed without this in team interaction and. And, and this dynamic environment across such diverse disciplines. Okay, Mike, I'll hand it back to you. All right, great. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to talk about the value process and the phases that are gone through in a traditional formal value engineering study. First, we have the information phase. The purpose of this is to understand the project background, to get a real understanding of what the team uh, developing the project was thinking. And, then we do a functional analysis phase where we're trying to understand the functions of the project. What is it that the project's really trying to accomplish? Then we move into the creative phase, which is where we're trying to generate ideas for alternative ways to accomplish those functions and improve value. We select the best ideas for value alternatives during the evaluation phase. Then we move to the development phase where we prepare the best alternatives for improving value. And then have the presentation phase where we're going to explain the value recommendations to the project stakeholders. So we're going to go through each of these in a little more detail, starting with the information phase. So here we're going to review all of the applicable project documents. We're going to listen to the owners who are going to discuss what the project needs are, why they are doing the project. We're going to listen to how they develop their design to fulfill that need. And then we're going to develop an initial cost model to provide insights to what's driving the costs uh, for the resources of the project. The cost model is typically based on the Pareto principle where we focus on the fact that typically 80% of the results are the result of just 20% of the causes. So a lot of times 80% of the cost is just due to 20% of the project. And so we're trying to identify those areas to focus on so we can provide high value improvements to the project. Under functional analysis, we're going to try to understand again those root functions and sub functions the project to drill down to really understand what it is it's trying. Typically, we're using verb noun phrases to describe those functions, and we arrange them using a function analysis system technique or FAST diagram. So and it's typically you know set up finding the questions of how we're doing things. So this, there's some examples here to inform a reader, communicate information, distribute information. And so as you move to the right, it describes how it's happening. If you move to the left, it describes why. If you move down, it describes when. So this just helps the team to, to evaluate what is it the function is really trying to do and how can we understand other ways that we might be able to achieve that same function. Then we move on to the creative phase. Now in the creative phase, we're trying to generate lots of ideas for alternative ways to accomplish the required functions. And everything during this phase is, is fair game. So rainbows, unicorns, whatever you can think of. The idea is to generate quantities of ideas uh, so that we can get good quality ideas. And no matter how crazy or rational they may seem, we want to welcome all thinking and ideas. And sometimes what we found is some of the craziest, most irrational ideas that get thrown out have led to inspiring some of the really great ideas that get submitted during the value engineering process. Once we've developed those creative ideas, then we go to the evaluation phase. And in the evaluation phase, we're going to select the best ideas that have been generated for our value alternatives. And team members are going to vote individually to select those top ideas and move them forward as developed value alternatives. And typically, that voting criteria is based on the quality of idea, benefit that it offers, the innovation that gets established, and the applicability to the project. And team members can advocate and discuss with each other the individual ideas that they think have merit might be overlooked in voting. So it's not, you know, a secret ballot. It's uh, there's still collaboration going on during the voting process. And we develop those ideas during the development phase. We're going to prepare them and basically try to explain and sell the idea between each value alternative. Describe the original concept, what the alternative is, why we're proposing the change, and the advantages and disadvantages that go with that. And then we're going to develop the cost impact 
to both first costs and also life cycle costs and provide supporting images and calculations to back it up. And then ultimately all that information gets put into the presentation phase where we're going to go and deliver that those recommendations for value improvements to the project stakeholders. And that's going to be summarizing those key alternatives, the benefits they offer, first costs, the life cycle costs, as well as typically recommending an optimum combination. Some value alternatives will be ex mutually exclusive and others will overlap. So we try to provide, here's, if we thought we could get the best value out of this project, how are we going to do that? And provide recommendation for that optimum co combination. It's important to know that stakeholder evaluation and selection of the value alternatives are not performed in connection with the presentation phase. That happens post-workshop. So during the post-workshop, that's when the value ensuring state report is delivered, uh, and developed to the, and delivered, submitted to the stakeholders. Stakeholders then have the opportunity to evaluate themselves and select which value alternatives need to be implemented. And they're implemented by the design team, not the value engineering team. So that's the important thing. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Ken now, who's going to start giving a couple examples, and I'll give a couple as well. Okay, thanks, Mike. Very interesting examples. Um, I, I just want to caveat at first uh, with, with some of these examples. We, we're just uh, discussing just a handful of examples, but it, it, examples for these uh, value engineering alternatives can be uh, extremely wide, extremely diverse, and can range in, in, in a cost savings amount from just small dollar amounts up to, to millions, just depending on, the, on the, the, the idea and the size and the scope of the project and the, and the, and the alternative de developed. Uh, additionally, the, the first cost in, in some of these uh, different types of value alternatives, the first cost, as Mike discussed, first cost can be can be on the small side, but you can actually achieve a significant value on the back end in, in large life cycle cost savings. And so, uh, as mentioned, I mean, these are just a handful of representative uh, examples here. Okay, next slide. Okay, this first one we're going to talk about it was a, a new uh, facility design with an extensive glazed facade system. Uh, when we were reviewing the, uh, the, the, the project, we discovered that the window glass layup specified for the project was much stronger than needed to mitigate the, the design load. Um, it, if, if you look, we, we, we have the different types of strengths at, at varying cost, uh, looking at, you know, anneal glass being the, the, the lowest strength and cheapest and fully tempered being the, the highest strength and highest cost. And, and this particular design utilized fully tempered, uh, fully th thermally tempered glass throughout. And it, looking back at the, the, the design, we, we realize that it, you don't really need the strength of glass to achieve your 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 your, the, your design requirements. So we recommended using an anneal glass um, layup in lieu of fully thermally tempered throughout the uh, the project uh, throughout the. the for, for all areas of the facility. And, and the, the architects really appreciated this one because this was a, a simple specification change. It didn't require redesign. They didn't have to go back and make a lot of changes. It was simple, go to the project spec, make the change and achieve the, the cost savings. So it, um, it, it, so it worked out really well. Um, it, the design performance was still compliant with the project requirements and it, it resulted in the cost savings of uh, approximately $600,000. Okay, next slide, please. Here's another example. This was a new campus design with multiple checkpoint inspection canopies. Uh, this particular design had prefabricated steel canopies uh, planned for the primary checkpoints where employees, visitors, VIPs, and, and such uh, enter the campus. But then there was a custom-built decorative steel canopy planned for the delivery checkpoint. Uh, the size of the canopies were the same for all locations on the site. And so we, we recommended using a prefabricated steel canopy, the, the, the same canopy identical to what's used at the other checkpoints in lieu of the custom built decorative steel canopy with the thought being that the, the truck drivers and delivery drivers didn't need an ornamental um, uh, a delivery uh, a checkpoint canopy uh, when, when they approached the campus. So the, uh, the checkpoint inspection was not, uh, the, the func functionality was not impacted by the change. It was just a, a, a simple swap out, the, 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 and the architecture didn't really matter in the back area where, where this was planned. 
uh, that resulted in a cost savings of approximately $150,000. Okay, next slide, please. Another example is uh, a legacy campus that, that we, we were uh, looking at with a new decorative concrete perimeter wall. Uh, we, when looking deeper into the project, we realized that the pro proposed perimeter protection was over-designed for many areas, and that some of the decorative features proposed uh, for this wall system were not visible in many areas. They were behind buildings and not within line of sight of any visitors or, or guests um, or, 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 or even primary tenants. The, um, the site included um, an existing perimeter wall in some areas that actually met the design standard or, or would meet the design standard with some mod minor modifications. And so we recommended combining the, the uh, uh, a combination perimeter, combining existing wall systems with new ones and, and modifying part of the existing wall and and to create kind of like a hybrid wall that that served the same function hybrid but it, it still maintained a lot of the aesthetic and architectural appearance as uh, as originally intended and it resulted it, it this resulted in significant cost savings over the initial design and the perimeter protection will still comply with uh, project requirements um another similar project uh, we were looking at uh completely different site uh, elsewhere um Speaking of perimeter walls, where the architect was designing a lapped perimeter wall system, just for aesthetic reasons, to instead of having a, a solid, flat, uh, unified perimeter wall, to, to create like an architectural relief on it by looking like they were individual panels being overlapped around the, the perimeter. And so we started looking at that, saying. Okay, I mean, this is a, a pretty substantial wall and with a, a lot of, of linear feet that we're dealing with here. And so anyway, once we started running the numbers and looking at all of the extra material involved with the, the laps and also not just the material, but the extra reinforcing detailing that was required at the laps, uh, we, we, we suggested um, removing the laps, just going to, to a standard flat wall for a significant cost savings on that one as well. Okay, uh, Mike will discuss the next project. Thanks, Ken. So this next project we're talking about is a site-wide perimeter vehicle impact barriers were to be installed at the site. And the initial concept used a single impact rating for all vehicle barriers, a, a pre-rated system uh, that would meet the project requirements. And, uh, but through reviewing the project, we realized that a reduced impact rating could be accepted for most of the areas of the project without reducing the vehicle performance, uh, vehicle protection performance. And so uh, a vector analysis was study was recommended to determine site specific impact ratings. Uh, and the image to the right is, is generic, but this, the basic concept was to look at the approach speeds around the site and uh, what was observed is generally you know, in the areas where you had the corners, uh, there was a lot of room to be able to get up to high speed, but most areas because you had to turn uh, to make an impact, the ener impact energy re was reduced significantly around the site. And so that allowed a lower impact rating to be adequate in most areas of the project. And as a result, a custom shallow foundation and baller barrier design were developed and validated through engineering analysis and testing. And even though that took a lot of time to, to develop that alternate design uh, and do the modeling and the testing, uh, it was uh, provided a significant improvement to the project. And because it was done early enough in the project, there was time to, to develop that, those requirements. It ultimately led to savings of a little over a million dollars for this project. Uh, so uh, it was a significant improvement, uh, even though it was going to take some additional time in engineering to develop it. And so Ken is now going to talk to us about incorporating the value engineering mindset into design. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, so incorporating the, the value engineering mindsets into the design, that, that's kind of the, the focus of the intent here for, for this uh, presentation is not so much how, how do you, for, for someone to go out and do a value engineering study on their own, um, it, 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 this is... Uh, the intent was kind of okay. Here, here are the here's how the value engineering team thinks. These are the types of things that they look at. The kind, of, you know, more of a behind the scenes look. So you can kind of take those same concepts and and, and work those into your overall design process. So you can continually, uh, so you can start incorporating these these uh, th this type of um, 
um, these types of benefits from from the on, on the front end of the project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the first one is um, employing the value interesting mindset uh, throughout design can help extract greater value while maintaining project requirements. And next is the value engineering process is most beneficial early in the project, where there's more room to develop and change design ideas. And we'll expand on this um, on, on this concept shortly. The next one is maintaining a focus on value throughout design process takes discipline, um, just like any other uh, you know any other uh, type of habit you develop, and it does need to develop into a habit to where you're continually thinking about this during the the varying steps of design. Is how, how can I make this how can I extract more value from this design um, and, and looking at looking at it from different ways in which you can uh, extract more value from the design um, on the on the front end and then and as with uh, the full value engineering studies that performed incorrectly uh, such an exercise will merely result in justification for cost cutting with the key factor value missing from the equation that and, and that's something to keep in mind too cutting just for the sake of cutting that's not the intent here the intent is to is to increase value, um, and so that it, uh, that has to stay top of mind when when approaching it um, from 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 this perspective. Can I slide, please? The, okay. The impact of timing on the VE process. Time timing is 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 uh, is a big factor here in the VE process because the the earlier you incorporate it in into the design, the, the more the more benefit can be achieved from it. Uh, if you if you wait too long, you you ultimately end up it'll cost you more to implement the design than what what than, than the return that, that that you'll get. And you can see from the chart where the you know the crossover from probability of acceptance to probability of rejection uh, that that it, it uh, your your potential net gain decreases as you continue through the process, and your your potential for for, for net loss increases as you go through the process. Um, it, it, but it, so sometimes, I mean, there there are there you know. Of course, there are, I mean, there are exceptions to every every rule. Um, but let's say, for example, like we were talking about simple specification changes, those may be able to be implemented, you know, farther down the path than than, than major design components. Um, but 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 but, the, but it, the, the thing is to be thinking about value from the from the front end. Ideally, you know, going back out to you know like the thirty five percent design phase prior to that. Um, you know, looking at it, where you're you're kind of developing the your your concept for the design. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, some tips for incorporating the value approach during design. Uh, the first one is close coordination and dynamic discussion with the other disciplines uh, on the design team becomes key during the value engineering study. There, there's intense discussion. On uh, amongst all of the disciplines on a variety of topics, and and and, and other disciplines contribute to, to 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 the discussion, even though it's outside of the disciplines, because sometimes they'll see things from a different perspective that the person that discipline may not see, where there's a where there's a conflict or where there's something that just you know, uh, or sometimes there's something you just you don't know what you don't know, and so you know, on the design team, sometimes you you'll run into where you know, oftentimes you know, you'll have an initial discussion, and then folks will go off and work in silos for extended periods and and, and such. So it's important to keep up that dynamic discussion throughout the process and keep the discussion going amongst the different disciplines to 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 uh, to, to try and, and and hit these you know some you know these key points to developing additional value throughout the, the process and, and and continue to bounce bounce ideas back and forth. I mean, if it looks like you know changes can be made. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's good to, to discuss those, um, and, and as Mike said, with you know just you know different ideas, uh, uh, you know different ideas will spur other ideas that someone else had had wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And I mean, it, it's it, maintaining a dynamic environment in, in that type of discussion is good practice. Um, identifying the root function the design should achieve. Uh, you, you don't want to really deviate. You, you still want to, like 
going back to the basis of value it, you, and, and function for the project, you need to keep in mind what, what is the root function and, and, and keep honing back on that as kind of your grounding point. Okay, what is the root function of this design? And also ask the questions, what if and why not? When generating ideas and developing potential alternatives for design improvements, um, it, it's, it, it's, it, it, I mean, it's it's always good to keep questioning, uh, you know, different things. It's like, can can we do this a little bit better? Can we do this a little bit differently? Um, especially when you're on the front end of the project and have more flexibility to to to, to make these changes. And then, um, as, as Dennis mentioned just a minute ago, when evaluating different design decisions, uh, revert back to the fundamental basis for increasing value. The, the, the value equals function over resources. Um, and, and, and also, as Mike discussed, to utilize the, the Pareto principle, the 80, 80, 80 20 principle, focusing on items comprising the, the top 80% of the cost, because oftentimes that's where you'll, you'll extract your, 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 your greatest uh, value changes for, for the project. Next slide, please. Okay, and the next step, uh, just to think beyond traditional constraints and go to solutions that, that may limit decisions. And as Mike discussed, the box, um, it, it, you know, that it, oftentimes, especially as engineers, we're always, you know, kind of, you know, we're always having a box put around us and say, you must stay with inside the box, you must stay with inside the box. And, and and but the thing is that sometimes the the, the law, it, it, sometimes th there are other alternatives out there that you don't you, you're so focused on the box you, you don't really see what other out alternatives that are that are, you, you can realistically do out there and and that you just don't think of you just keep going back to your same go to approach that you've always done because you know it works you know it's been accepted and in, in the past and and so it, it it helps to keep that uh, you know creative thinking going during this process because uh, you know as Mike said it alluded to some perceived limitations are true constraints and others aren't uh, yeah, people they say sometimes designers just think they have constraints in certain areas when in reality those strength and constraints don't exist um, they do in some instances and others they don't and so it, it's good to, to, to really dig, dig, dig a little bit deeper into that area generate multiple ideas and down select afterwards um, based on the, the merits of quality Value, value, benefit, innovation, and acceptability. Like Mike mentioned, um, you, you know, you generate lots of ideas to, to, to get some really good ideas, and oftentimes some of the, you, you know, di different ideas uh, it, it may not be so good in, on the front end, but you know, like Mike mentioned, it may inspire some additional ideas uh, if, by, by someone else. And then um, lastly, realize when good is good enough and diminishing returns take hold. Mike had discussed that when, when he showed his, uh, his diagram. Uh, otherwise, poor value may result. Uh, sometimes you can you keep peeding things into the ground and trying to get squeak a little bit more out of it. But at, at some point, you, you'll, you'll reach a point of diminishing returns. And, 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 and it's going to be, uh, you're essentially, you'll, you'll get a negative result out of it. Or not negative, but you, you, you just won't re re really be, it, it's not worth it at that point to continue. Okay, next slide. Okay, in conclusion, um, just to reiterate what we uh, discussed earlier, uh, form a value engineering study can extract greater value from design projects while maintaining project requirements. And when performed correctly with a focus on function, alternatives, and team dynamics, value engineering can maximize design so it meets required functions without sacrificing quality. And then lastly, incorporating the value engineering mindset throughout the design process can also help in extracting greater value from the design. Very That's good. It for me. Ken, thank you so much. What a, what a great presentation. Mike, awesome work on, uh, on your presentation today. Uh, so if you have questions, folks, uh, please begin submitting those now into the Q&A pod. Uh, remember, we, we talked about that earlier. If you have a, a question, put it into the Q&A. We'll answer as many as we possibly can within the time that we have available. Next chart, please. Before we get into to the Q&A, I want to give you time to, uh, to enter your questions in. I want to let you know about some upcoming webinars uh, that are coming out of our Webinar Wednesday series. We've been at this for a couple of years now, every month. Uh, on one Wednesday a month, we have a presentation on various topics around the transportation and infrastructure world. 
Our next presentation is May the 25th, and it is on prediction and design for extreme load events using digital twins. Our speaker for that is Robert Lunsford. On June the 29th, we have pavement dynamics. How important is pavement dynamics under different dynamic loads? By Dr. Hyung Lee. And then on July 20th, we have mechanistic analysis of asphalt rutting and airfield pavements using the viscoplastic shift model. Dr. Ghassan Chahab will be presenting that presentation in our July webinar Wednesday. And we'll have many more exciting topics and presenters in the works for 2022. We have our calendar pretty well filled out for the year, and we look forward to, to putting these webinars on and helping to expand the knowledge base of our, of our community. So next slide, please. All right, so slide uh, into the Q&A session now. Uh, the first question, and, and Mike and Ken, I'm going to let you figure out who's the best person to take this one on. Uh, this question comes from Ali. and says, what is the best time to perform a VE analysis? Uh, Bill, I, I can take that one. That, that goes back to the chart I was uh, speaking of earlier uh, with the diagram. That, that, that showed the, the, the net gain and net loss. Um, it, it typically, you know, a lot of these studies are done like a, about 35% design. And so if you can, you know, if you start thinking about this value engineering process, you know, from that point, uh, you know, you know, beyond, um, you know looking forward um, prior to that, that would ideally be the, the you know, the, the best time to perform it, the, you know, the sooner the better once you start having, once you get to the point where, where you can start um, developing the, um, you, you know, a, a, a good tangible design, it's, uh, it, and, it, and, it, and it varies based on project too. I mean, it, it, I mean, there's no one size fits all, but typically say somewhere around 35% design is, is, is generally a, a good, um, a good point. Um, for that. Sounds good. Another question came in. Uh, is it important for the members of the VE team to be independent from the design team or can or should there be some overlap? That's my character. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, for a, a good quality VE study, a uh, formal one, you will have the VE team members will not be uh, integrated in the, the design team at all. And the purpose of that really is so you have folks that are completely separated from the thought processes of the design team to get unique perspectives and to enable you to challenge those uh, constraints that tend to get put on the design team, the assumptions that are made, the, the conclusions of things that they make as they make their design decisions. But you can, like we've talked with using the value engineering process, you could have people on the same team also as you're de de developing design to kind of ask those same kind of questions and provide a different perspective. So they may have some involvement, but less involvement. Usually a fresh set of eyes will give you a more creative uh, take on and perspective to come up with good value ideas. Oh, that sounds great. Hey, I've got one from, uh, from Lewis that's coming in. The question is, what's the proper team size for a value engineering team? I, I, I could imagine you know that, that too big of a team of course would be difficult and unruly and, and too small of a team wouldn't get you the ideas you're you're looking for so any any hint there on, on team size okay. uh, Mike I can take that one yeah the, the size largely varies by project um, and 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 in the, the type and, and scale of, of the project I mean you're not going to have a massive team for for a very small very limited project but, but oftentimes maybe five to eight people you know with you know diverse backgrounds it is is, uh, is 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 kind of typical um, and so some I mean some of these teams I mean they're, they're so big for these massive multi you know really large large capital projects some some of these you can have multiple VE teams that are split and fo focused on different aspects of the project and, and then, you know, come together to, to um, you know, collaborate on it. And so it, 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 it the proper size, I mean, there is no one proper size, essentially. It, it, it largely varies on the project, but typically maybe five to eight 
technical disciplines, maybe more. It, 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 it just depends on the size and, and scope of the project. Very good. We've got a, another question that came in, uh, and, and if I know this is not exactly your background, so let me know. It's, it's closer to mine. But the question is, do you have any value engineering examples related to pavement design or construction? Yeah, Bill, I'd say Ken, neither Ken and I have any experience working those uh, type of projects, but uh, I do know that FHWA makes a lot of use of the value engineering process and, and know that those are things that are used frequently. I don't know if you have any examples you can share. Yeah, Mike, I'll take off my uh, my moderator hat and maybe put on my helping answer question hat. And, uh, and yes, uh, I, ARA has been involved in many pavement design and construction related VE studies over the years. Uh, in, in some cases, it's really about, you know, engineering the, 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 the road itself. Uh, in many cases, a lot of, you know, in that, in that value equation that, that you guys were, you know, so well put together, you know, that function divided by resources uh, equation of, of value, uh, a lot of the value can come from the construction process, right? So, you know, if we can cut down on the number of operations, if we can optimize you know, the, the, the type of pavement, the, the paving operations, if we can cut an operation out, uh, that would, you know, have a pretty big impact on that, on that value equation because we're using less resources. Uh, we also do look at the function side of it on the pavement side too, though, right? Uh, to the appropriate constraints, whatever those might be, but we might look at innovative materials or, or some, other, uh, some other items that are out there. All right, next, uh, next question is uh, from Samantha. How long does a VE study typically take? As Mike, I can take that. It, uh, most of the VE studies that we've been involved on typically take uh, anywhere from three to five business days. And it uh, depends really on the, the scope of the project. Uh, have seen some, though, that take uh, multiple weeks uh, for some very large projects uh, where they break it down into smaller segments. Uh, but uh, typical is, is three to five business days. And that's, that's just for the, the main process, the, the final report, and uh, will be delivered at, usually after that formal workshop. And, and Mike, I know the ones that I've been involved with, those are not three to five short days. They tend to be, these, these are not for the faint of heart being involved in these. They're pretty long <laughs> and intense days. They can be long and intense days, that's correct. I've definitely <laughs> had over eight hour days before. <laughs> Absolutely. Much more than eight-hour days in, in many cases, but but the, the, the answer is awesome when it when it comes out. Diane asks, why is a CVS required for VE studies? And and if you could then remind folks what a CVS is. I, I, I this is Ken. I can take that. But uh, yeah, the CVS is the Certified Value Specialist. It's a it's a professional certification. Um, that's issued, and you need a, extensive experience in in, in leading the uh, VE teams, uh, working with VE teams, and 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 you have to it, 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 you have to take an exam to get it, just like the, your, your most professional certifications. And it, it essentially it's it's I mean kind of like the for 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 value engineering, it's essentially like the professional engineer license for with, with, for value engineering. Um, or the PMP certification for, for project managers. It's a professional certification shows that you demonstrates that you have the, the required background, uh, required testing, required level of experience uh, and, and knowledge base to successfully implement the, the formal value process uh, throughout the the, the, the VE study. They have the value process. It's, it's a very, it's, it's a very, um, you know, kind of a straightforward process, and 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 you need someone to, to lead these teams that is well versed in the process, knows exactly how and why the, the process works that it does, and how to successfully implement the process from start to finish. Thank you, Ken. Kevin uh, Kevin asked a question: Could you implement VE at multiple points in a project? Yes, Mike. Uh, certainly, you could. As it, like Ken indicated before, most often it's done early in the project, but there could certainly be projects where it could be beneficial to, to have a secondary VE study later in the process to, to ensure that still you're maximizing the value you can get out of the project. It anticipates usually going to be larger projects that are going to have the, the benefit from having multiple VE studies. Outstanding. And uh, Dan asks, uh, how do VE studies differ from you know what some would call an innovative design or just an innovation process 
Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, this is Ken. I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah, yeah. In innovation is, is more generic term than value engineering. Um, it, 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 uh, the VE team is more specific to the project or situation at hand rather than a, a specific um, item. Uh, the VE uh, value engineering often requires innovative ideas applied, but they're, they're, they're not, uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're separate. I mean, apples and oranges um, sort of thing. Um, and so it, it's, it's just that the, you know, the VE is specific to the project you're working on and innovative ideas can be incorporated in as part of the VE. Outstanding. Well, we've got a number of other questions that are, that are in the Q and a pod. Uh, what I would ask at this time, because we want to wrap things up and respect the time uh, that you folks have today that you've made for our presentation and for our presenters, uh, you have their emails. They're on the screen right now. You are welcome uh, to send them an email directly. If you asked a question in the Q&A, we'll ask, we'll get those to our presenters today and we'll see if they can get you an email response. But please feel free, uh, especially, you know, in the next day to, to reach out to Mike, to reach out to Ken. You've got their contact information and they've made a pledge that they will answer questions as part of uh, the follow-up from this webinar Wednesday presentation. So with that, um, Mike, next slide, please. So everyone who participates in the webinar is available to get a full hour of professional development hours. Uh, as you know, today's presentation is being recorded, and a link of that will be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday website sometime no later than early next week. And we will send a PDH certificate to all participants that, are verified, that were verified in attendance, uh, and they, uh, the PDA certificate will be for the one full hour of the webinar. Uh, a copy of today's presentation will also be included for all of you who participated online, uh, and, and you'll get a, a PDF version of today's slides. Please allow a couple of weeks to receive your certificate. Next slide, please. ARA is always looking for great people to join our team. Uh, that if you are interested in employment opportunities, no matter where you are in your career, if you're just getting, you're a student and you're just getting started, or you're looking for that uh, that next opportunity, please uh, reach out. Come join ARA. Uh, ARA has offices all across the United States, uh, and you can reach out to us. Of course, you can look on careers.ara.com for all the job postings we have open. But you can also reach out to us directly at www.joinara at ara.com. So that's the webinar Wednesday, www.joinara at ara.com. So you can put your res uh, a resume in there and contact information, and we'll also route that to the appropriate folks. At this time, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope that you'll join us on May 25th for our next webinar Wednesday which will be Prediction of Design for Extreme Load Events Using Digital Twins by Robert Lunsford. Thank you very much, folks, and have a wonderful day.